afternoon. Hey, sweetheart, how are you? Good, good. All right. Welcome everyone to the social and emotional learning tools for equity webinar. We're so excited that you all are joining us today. And we are even more excited to share these tools with the public. So um, as you enter, please feel free to introduce yourself. Um, let us know where you're zooming in from in the chat. And if you represent an organization, please feel free to share that. I'm just going to go over our agenda today. We're right at the welcome portion. The next item on the agenda is we're going to be framing the need for our social and emotional learning tools. Then we're going to share some of the present dangers, the attacks against social and emotional learning and critical race theory. Next, we'll walk through a timeline and development process for this particular project. And then we will have a walkthrough of each of the social and emotional learning tools. So the principles and the rubric. Lastly, before we open it up uh, to the formal question and answer period, we will do a use case where we will invite um, a sort of a comparison or an assessment of a unit from the forthcoming Project Ready 3.0 curriculum against the rubric. So we are really excited to get started. This webinar will be recorded. Um, so if you won't, if you're not able to stay the entire time with us, we will certainly be able to share the recorded webinar with you um, after it concludes. So my name is Adenike Huggins. I am Senior Director of Education Policy and Advocacy at the National Urban League. And I'll be walking you through today's presentation. So first, I want to frame the need. And I thought that this quote from uh, Dr. Dina Simmons really helped to encapsulate why we thought we needed to include tools and resources that come from our perspective and really speak uh, to our experiences. I'm going to read it aloud, and I encourage you to also read it. So she said, when SEL is taught to students, particularly students of color, without any context, it can become inherently problematic. What's the point of teaching children about conflict resolution skills if we're not talking about the conflicts that exist because of racism or white supremacy? Without that nuance, she says, SEL risks turning it into white supremacy with a hug. And certainly we don't want to undermine the importance of this work, but we feel that without the proper framing, much of the positive aspects and attributes associated with social and emotional learning can actually fall by the wayside. So what she's calling for here is culture, context, and community. And hearing that, we really wanted to make sure that we incorporated that into our work, into our approach, as we set out to embark on this process. But I do wanna share that there were obviously um, some things that have been happening around social and emotional learning, as well as largely in the education community. And I would like to bring in my colleague, Horatio Blackman, to talk a bit about what the present dangers are regarding social and emotional learning, as well as critical race theory. Horatio? Thanks, Adenike. So the 
racial reckoning, and I use that term cautiously, that our nation had in 2020, 2021, barely lasted two years before conservative leaders rallied to push back against our efforts to create more equitable learning and developmental environments for Black youth. And so as we sit nearly halfway through 2022, amidst the ongoing dual pandemic of racialized violence and COVID-19, we continue to see a concerted effort to prevent the creation and sustaining of those equitable learning and developmental environments. But still, and you'll see with our principles and our guides, and you'll understand that we have to continue to root SEL and racial equity. Those two things should not and cannot be disconnected. You can't talk about the challenges our Black youth face without discussing racial identity. You can't maximize their opportunities to become thriving adults without promoting positive racial identity formation. You can't talk about uplifting one's community without understanding that some of the challenges Black individuals and communities face due to systemic and interpersonal racism. You can't ignore the strengths of our communities as they have continued to fight to be recognized as full citizens and human beings here in America. And so we reject efforts to decenter racial equity and social emotional learning and instead promote that through our principles and our rubric. And as Adenike said a few slides ago, we reject white supremacy with a hug. Through our rubric and our principles, we're laying the foundation and providing a guide for uplifting the strengths of Black people and communities as a means to creating and sustaining high quality learning and developmental environments for our youth. This is about our youth being prepared for their future and these tools support those efforts. However, this is happening in the backdrop of growing misperception and increasing pushback against social emotional learning to be in our schools and our other sites of learnings as a perversion of critical race theory continues to be used as a boogeyman to halt any efforts at educational and developmental equity. This is a decidedly politicized effort to insert or interject noise into our work by, for example, banning books from schools or passing legislation to prevent even the uses of terms like equity or implicit bias in the very documents and trainings used for educators and youth development staff that are intended to support equity. However, uh, next slide. One bright spot in all of this is that from Mexican research that we've been shown uh, across demographic and partisan lines, there's still widespread support for SEL among parents. Parents largely hear the term SEL and they take it at face value. There aren't these significant negative top of mind associations with it. Um, there's widespread support for teaching SEL in school um, with the majority of parents already believing that it's taught in their schools and an even larger percentage of parents in support of having it in their schools. Um, parents support the principles and the skills that we talk about in social emotional learning, um, and they don't see it as a substitute for the mental wellness and mental health supports that our youth need. They see it as supportive of that. So uh, we know social emotional learning is good for all of our kids, and we need to continue to push that messaging while also recognizing the unique needs of our Black youth. Thanks, Horatio. And now, considering all of that um, that has been going on and continues to go on, I think that we recognize that now more than ever, this work is critical and it is essential. So I'm going to take some time to walk you through our project timeline. Um, and so starting in October 2019, we were actually in New Orleans for the Grant Makers uh, for Education conference. And while we were there, we conducted our first two listening sessions with the help of our um, Urban League of Louisiana affiliate, they were able to successfully recruit 
uh, two focus groups for us, one for parents and the other for out of school time providers. And as we went through our protocol, we noticed that what was coming up quite often was what the deficiencies were in the current slate of resources that are in the SEL universe. Then we moved on to February and March of 2020. And here we sort of had a blitz of activity. We refined our protocols and we conducted listening sessions with folks in early childhood education. We also did another parent focus group. We um, spoke with teachers. We spoke to researchers of color, um, arts programmers, social workers, and those in the juvenile justice space. And then I don't know if anyone remembers anything significant about March 2020, but the pandemic happened. And all of the listening sessions that we had done before that point were in person. And so we had to uh, think about how we were going to adjust our work as we wanted to continue on with the process. By that time though, we felt like we had um, pretty good information in terms of what was coming out of the focus groups. And with the support of Alicia Alstrom from the Forum for Youth Investment, we were able to analyze the uh, notes from those various listening sessions and pull out some themes. So we are forever in, indebted and we're grateful for that uh, qualitative analysis that she was able to provide for us that really helped us to contextualize all of the things that we were hearing. Um, and then in September, 2020, what we did was we did um, an SEL primer. We shared back some of the information that we had heard from the listening sessions, but overall we were really trying to make a case for equity and why equity was really what was important as we were learning more from the findings of the listening session. And then in December, we had been working on refining that report and we shared that report back with all of the listening session participants. And it was really important for us to continue to have that feedback loop because we did not want people to just be um, called upon to give their uh, assessments or their opinions on what was going on, but not to know what would end up what, what would happen to all of the contributions that they made. And so we were really intentional about including um, folks at, along every step of the way. And so everyone who participated in the listening sessions received the, the, the report in December. And then in January of 2021, what we did was we convened an SEL advisory committee and that advisory committee comprised of some of the participants from our listening sessions, as well as more deeper participation from our Urban League affiliates. At the same time, we also convened an SEL Youth Advisory Committee. These students primarily came from our Youth Council, which are representatives from Project Ready across the country. We also worked uh, with um, our scholar in residence, Joe, to create some additional contacts and context so that we could continue to workshop our tools. You know, we never meant for this to be the end all be all. We really see this work as being iterative. And most of all, we want it to be useful and practical. So we have collected. Um, tons of feedback, probably from over 100 people over the last two and a half years. Um, and so we're really proud of the moment that we're at now. But we do want to acknowledge the journey um, that this work has uh, sort of taken us through. 
And then, you know, for the better part of this year through where we are today, we worked on really refining it and getting the design aspects down pat. Because what we heard from our SEL youth, as well as the adults, was that it must be accessible, not just in language, but in the way that it was presented. And so we could have as we could have the greatest tools and resources. Um, but if it's a white paper that no one is going to use and it's going to end up on a shelf, then it really is not worth the time and effort that we're putting into it. And so we had to really think about some creative ways of presenting the information so that um, all folks from our community would be able to fully access it. Also definitely wanna give a shout out to um, Robin Ince, who was instrumental in getting this project off the ground. And while she is no longer here with us at the National Urban League, um, we certainly would be remiss without acknowledging all of her instrumental work in getting this work done. And at this time, I would like to ask a few of the folks who have journeyed with us um, to, sh to share their experiences as it relates to participation either in a listening session or um, on the SEL advisory committee or with the workshops that we did. So Natalie, would you mind sharing what that experience is like for you as a participant in the early childhood educators listening session? Mm -hmm. Good afternoon. Um, that was my last trip to, to New York mm -hmm. before everything shut down. So I remember that well. Um, it was a great opportunity to come together. I've uh, dedicated my career in early child development here at the Greater Phoenix Urban League. And it seemed like our group were, were, we were all part of different parts of the country, but we all had the same message. This has been very important in early child development, looking at the whole child, looking at trauma, looking at all of the experiences that children go through, building that social emotional. But as we bridge that to elementary school, it has seemed to, to fade out. So this gave us an opportunity to show all the strengths that we already have in early child development, identify the gaps, and then move forward of what we would like to see. You know, it was, we were painting a picture of how it should be um, to have children to be successful. So it was a very great experience in that, in really actually getting to know that this is happening across our country and the importance of having that bridge gapped. And so, um, as we, we started to think about how that social emotional and, and that whole child learning is and moving it towards the elementary school, those things came up is um, involving the parent, involving the community, because if you don't, it's gonna be put on a shelf. Um, it will turn into a curriculum, it might be bought, it might be uh, training for teachers and it might go through the process, but then it <clears throat> goes back to the same things we've been doing years and year after year. So. I was very um, grateful to be part of that. Thank you so much, Natalie. And now I'd like to in, invite Brianna Woods or Bree to talk about her experience as a member of the Social and Emotional Learning Youth Advisory Committee. Uh, thank you. Hi, I'm Bree Woods. I'm from the Louisville Urban League. And I definitely appreciated being able to speak on um, the social emotional learning um, documents they've been putting together and have a say in the language, especially in my state recently. Um, there have been a lot of adults just deciding what can or can't be said and like taught in the classroom and how classroom management is supposed to happen. And so for this to be so focused and so receptive to like teachers, parents, and students and researchers. I really appreciate that. And I think that the end result is something that will be productive and truly helpful to the people that it impacts. Bree, thank you so much for sharing your experience. You know, when we were conducting the listening sessions in March, um, unfortunately, one of the last ones that we had scheduled, but we were unable to actually do 
was uh, with young people. And that was because uh, as things were kind of getting close to shutting down, we felt like it was probably that the best idea to go into a school um, and to do this work. But we wanted to make sure that we capture the voices of young people at some point uh, throughout the process. So really appreciate the fact that Brie was able to, to join us on our journey. And here, I just wanna lift up a few of the quotes that came out of uh, some of the, the listening sessions. Um, and as you can see, very similar in terms of what folks are saying is needed, um, what is not currently there, and reminding everyone that this information is really what informed the development of the tools. So we listened um, and we made sure that we were able to really address and fully target uh, the areas in which folks said, we really need more support. We need more context. We need more cultural relevance here. Um, and I do think it's very important that the, the second quote you see here is from someone who was in juvenile justice and said, you know, this really should be for the adults. Um, and we obviously believe that social and emotional learning, um, as well as education, is really for everyone. And it should be for, it should really be for the benefit of everyone. So we don't see this as just being a space where uh, it's for the development of young people, but really also for everyone who interacts with other people as well as young people themselves and the adults. And so we don't see this as just kind of like a one directional approach, but really um, a way to involve the entire community in the teaching and learning process. And now I am going to turn it over to Joe Rogers, who joined us as a scholar in residence to talk and walk through the design principles for social and emotional learning. Joe? Hi, Adeniki. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Good to see all of you. Thanks for being here. My name is Joe Rogers, and I had the great pleasure of serving with an outstanding team of New York, uh, National Urban League staff and, and consultants and all the stakeholders that Adonike has mentioned and uh, some of whom you've heard from here today in developing these uh, documents, these tools that we're talking about here today. And really excited that they're finally uh, being released. Uh, the, the great premiere day is here. And again, as Adonike said, I think there's always room for growth and improvement. So the kind of feedback that you all, I hope, will provide to the league going forward will help, will continue to strengthen what we have here and make it um, even more useful to you in the years to come. Uh, change happens and we need to be able to adapt to it. So uh, I, I look forward to hearing more about what you think about these documents as well as how you use them. I want to thank Adonike. Uh, Horatio. I want to thank uh, fellow scholar and residents, uh, Beth Glenn. I want to thank Robin Ince and also uh, Hal Smith of the Urban League for their support and the opportunity to contribute to this document. Uh, I see this document, particularly this, uh, what, we, what ended up being called the design principles as a conversation starter. It's not, um, it doesn't solve the entire problem. And Beth Glenn, I know, is going to talk a little bit more about the practical tools that you can use to consider and implement and reevaluate the work uh, using these principles. But I really see this as a starting point in, in many ways, or perhaps a better said, a continuation um, or a catalyst of further conversation on some of the work that you all are already doing from wherever you sit. Uh, so often I go to conferences, I read documents, uh, policy papers, white papers, and black papers, if you will, and uh, you know, you have a good conversation, it plans some good ideas, but you don't get to use it. So I'm really excited and encouraged by the National Urban League's commitment to supporting our communities going forward and making this a really practical and meaningful experience that makes a real difference in our communities. I want to, as we, I think if we move to the, the blow up version of the wheel or the circle, however you want to think about it, um, that, that highlights the key areas or the elements or principles. Uh, I kind of think of this as a, as a, a nutritional 
chart, sort of a food circle, food pyramid, if you will. There are seven key ingredients here, or seven key food groups. Each of them is essential. And depending on your body chemistry, in this case, your body being could be your school, your nonprofit organization, your community center, uh, wherever learning takes place, your faith-based institution, you may need a little bit more of uh, the yellow uh, food, you may need a little more of the purple food, uh, but each of these is essential. And so I wanna take a few minutes to walk you through what's here and knowing that you'll spend a lot more time. We have a, I think it's an 11 page document that's now available on the league's website. So I hope you'll take the time to read through it completely and thoroughly and I hope it's useful to you. But today I just wanna take you around the wheel, around the food circle and I wanna highlight a couple of uh, principles that are near and dear to my heart and that I think uh, bring the, the importance and the usefulness of these concepts um, to the fore. So why don't we start, uh, we'll go clockwise. This isn't a, a, your ordinary document, but we're gonna, we're gonna take a status quo approach to walking through the circle. And so why don't we start with collective and individual well-being, growth and success. In society today, and I think this isn't necessarily a, a brand new development, although I think we see much more of it today in the sort of the me culture, um, and so often schools and other places where learning happen uh, can emphasize or reinforce this idea that it's really about the individual. It's about just pure competition, ruthless competition, getting ahead, uh, getting the best education you can get so you can make more money, climb the ladder, uh, you know, be famous and whatever, whatever else, uh, you know, whatever other goals society prioritizes these days. Not to say that there's anything wrong with any one of those, but because this is coming, this is really grounded in our history and culture and some of our, our brilliant scholarship and lived experience, it's, it's really important that this, this principle, set of principles focus on our collective well-being and the importance of making sure that our young people feel um, a sense of connectedness and a sense of commitment and obligation even, uh, a sense of social and, and communal responsibility to collective advancement. Uh, moving around the wheel, again, clockwise, we, we'll look at the equitable distribution of developmental resources and learning opportunities. You can see that in Peach. I think that is, I'm not very good with colors, but work with me on this. Uh, but what's really important here is that so often in these conversations about SEL or whole child development or whatever phrase we want to use is we talk about tweaking around the margins. We talk about big ideas and a lot of theories. And so often when, when we attempt to or when some of us attempt to implement um, and actualize what we're learning, we run up against major resource barriers. And just for example, and I'm not telling those of you who have, are in schools or have worked in schools or really any institution, anything new, uh, but I just wanna highlight a couple of examples in that category. Uh, we talk about individualized, personalized learning, and that's certainly reflected in this document and in the SEL conversation in general. If we don't have, for example, smaller class sizes and enough staff, to staff those smaller classes, or it could be enough staff to staff our youth development programs appropriately, it's gonna be very difficult for whoever's leading or facilitating those programs and conversations and it's learning and development to provide that personalized learning. Uh, it, and that, that requires additional resources. It requires an investment. It's not just a conversation. It's not just something you can tell teachers to do or tell a youth, uh, program director to do, you actually need to pony up and, and put your money where your SEL conversation is. Um, and so seldom does it actually happen. And, and I, I think uh, we should also talk about library media specialists uh, or librarians, if you will, school librarians. In so many communities, including the one I live in, the large majority of schools uh, are not providing access to school librarians who can help them research topics and issues that are meaningful and important to them that can help them develop their identity, uh, a positive identity, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, and so often in other communities, those resources, those staff who are specially trained to help our young people navigate information and use information and discover who they are in this world are missing. 
So we can't just focus on the conversation and, and, and the big picture. We actually have to invest. And often that requires additional funding or funding to be used in different ways. Uh, continuing around the circle, center the cultural values, traditions, and inspirations of Black and Brown people. I can't tell you how many SEL-related conversations I've been in that are uh, sort of watered down. They can apply. They're so universal as to be essentially meaningless for me and disconnected from the reality of particularly our Black and Brown young people. And we talk in this set of design principles in the rubric about the different ways in which Black and Brown people show up, the different facets or aspects of our identity, which are complex. Uh, but in so many conversations, these, this, um, the centering of our values, our traditions, and, and, and the inspirations, the great things that we've done and continue to do are missing. We don't have to go outside of our communities to look to what those people are doing in order to develop our young people, to develop ourselves as whole and effective and successful and joyful human beings. We have a great history within Black and Brown communities of doing this work successfully. So let's, let's, look, let's, look, uh, let's look at ourselves. Uh, purple, uh, shout out to Prince, uh, full circle process from concept development to implementation. I, I, anyone here like uh, cake? Anyone here like cake? Chocolate cake, vanilla cake, dolce de leche, you know, what, what kind of cakes do you all like? Okay, love cake. I see some cake lovers in the chat. Uh, so often I show up to these meetings and historically, these days I kind of, I stay away from these scenes because I just can't handle. Uh, but I've been to meetings where uh, the room is full of, it's mostly white folks, for, uh, and uh, we're talking about solving problems for Black and Brown communities, particularly helping to achieve racial justice and equity in education and in learning and development. And so, you know, for me, the metaphor I, I like to use, or that I thought of just for today, is sort of like a, there's nothing wrong, you know, all cakes, cake is good. I'm vegan, I like vegan cake in particular. But so often what happens is that we, meaning black and brown people, become the sprinkles on the, the vanilla cake. The vanilla cake with white frost, with, uh, with uh, vanilla frosting. And then at the end of the process, after the cake is baked, someone sprinkles us on top of the cake, or they may pour a little bit like culture, uh, caramel uh, drizzle on the cake. And that's supposed to finish the cake. And that makes the cake look good. And then everybody can eat the cake that we weren't involved in baking. Right? We, weren't, we, weren't, we weren't the essential ingredients of that cake. And so it's a very simple, simple notion and concept that I think everyone here today can appreciate that we need to be involved. Uh, we need to be leading the process from the very beginning. That doesn't exclude collaborators from other communities, but we're talking about making sure our young people have everything they need and our older folks too, our adults need in order to, to become joyful and successful um, collectively successful human beings and communities, we need to make sure that those folks we're talking about are at the table. And I think that's why the league's approach in this case, really centering the voices, the research, the expertise of black and brown folks with input and, um, and exchanges with other communities is really important and valuable. So I encourage you to take some time with that section. Uh, moving along, let me speed up a little bit here because I, I want to make sure there's ample time for conversation. And I know that Beth is next. And let me see, I maybe, am I frozen here? Okay, all right, all right. I think I had a, a bandwidth issue for a moment. So make it plain. Use language for all, uh, use language for all literacy levels. Again, I've worked in academia. Uh, historically, and I've been in, in, in a lot of conversations where, and read a lot of documents where it's only, uh, lang uses la they use policy jargon, legal language, other language that only a few people can understand. And so often that excludes the people who are hurting the most, who are directly, uh, who are most directly affected by the decisions that are being made. And so we need to ensure that the language we're using in our documents, in our conversations, um, is, is fully accessible to all of our community stakeholders. And that takes, sometimes that takes more work, uh, but it's worth the investment and it's worth the care and consideration to make sure it's inclusive because the state direct stakeholders, the folks who are gonna sustain uh, this work 
and um, need to be involved from the beginning, but in order to do that, need access to the information. Develop positive racial identities and, and, and skill sets. Um, I think that's self-explanatory. I encourage you to read the section. Um, there's so many negative messages that are competing for, uh, that we're bombarded with, really inundated with negative messages about black and brown people, some of them promoted by our own folks. And it's really important that any learning environment, schools or otherwise, are fully equipped and oriented and committed to making sure that you're not just successful, you get into college, but actually that you have a strong and positive sense of your own racial and cultural identity uh, in a way that allows you to navigate and interact with the broader world and to also be true and, and supportive and successful within um, your own community. Finally, uh, focus on our strengths. Uh, again, I think there's probably no one here who hasn't heard of the difference or the distinction between a deficit-based approach and a strengths-based approach. But so often, as the, as the design principles explain or really up, uh, uh, hold up, we talk about broken black and brown children. We talk about broken and failing black and brown schools. We talk about broken and um, almost pathologically um, uh, pathologically uh, uh, problematic black and brown institutions. And so this document argues, really recommends, strongly recommends that we need to focus on the strengths of our young people, of our institutions, of our history, of our culture. Um, again, this isn't news to some of you, but as you know, those of you who are in the field or those of you in schools, so, so seldom um, do we have holistically, uh, we have holistic environments to really bring up the strengths. Uh, I think that's, I think those are the main points that I wanted to highlight here. Um, but uh, again, I appreciate the opportunity. I, I hope that you all uh, spend some time with the document digging into those pages, and I hope they're useful to you and look forward to receiving additional feedback. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Joe. And now I'd like to invite our other scholar in residence, Beth Glenn, to give us a walk and talk through the rubric documents. Beth? Thank you, Adenike. Um, can you everybody hear me OK? The thumbs up, I can't see. Uh... This one, oh, thank you very much. Um, so I wanted to uh, apologize a little bit in advance. They're doing some construction around my building. That's why I've got the headphones on. So I've tried to minimize that background noise. If any comes through, you know, let me know in the chat and I'll try and um, uh, minimize that a little bit more. And I wanted to uh, start off with gratitude, of course, thanking everybody at, at uh, SEL, Adenike, and Hal, and Robin formerly. It was fantastic to work with Joe on this project and excited to uh, dialogue with you all about how we can put this to work in the, in the world. And really appreciated what Horatio said at the outset. You know, we wanted to root social and emotional learning in racial equity and really focus on the support and the context um, that a lot of these SEL principles were getting communicated in or not getting communicated in and to train our eye on social justice. So in short, we wanted to emphasize with these tools that individuals exist, they're situated within communities, just as Joe highlighted, that we make decisions about how those communities are structured and those decisions can either lead to equity or inequity and that we're responsible for pushing towards equity. So what our tools allow you to do is to uh, interrogate a proposed uh, cell curriculum or a current cell curriculum, but wider than just looking at explicitly a program that talks about cell. It's really about whatever practices throughout your school or youth development experience are happening and they're either going to contribute to growth and learning or they're going to hinder it. And I would encourage folks to really evaluate the range of practices that comprise the whole climate and experience of your youth development program or the whole climate and development uh, experience of your school. So look at discipline, look at the traditions that you engage in, uh, you know, for everything from field days to, you know, 
uh, dances and 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 um, uh, you know having classes compete against each other, classroom and group processes and policies to really see what these practices are teaching young people about social emotional function. And in other words, what's the hidden curriculum that emerges from all these decisions that we make about attendance, about dress codes, about grading practices, names of teams, our groups and mascots, and our structures. And then ask ourselves, do the sum total of these experiences either foster appreciation for difference, positive identity formation, community orientation, agency, anti-oppressive ethics, you know, all the, the principles that we set out in the first document, or do these experiences hinder the growth and development of these positive outlooks? So seeing how, you know, cell was really being integrated into youth spaces, we wanted to give people an on-ramp to thinking about what might be missing, how they could integrate um, what might be missing, how they could add to it, and then how they could ask their young people what was needed and try and change their practices because of it. And we discussed a number of ways that you could use the rubric. You could have staff and young people reflect on the proposed or existing practice and then choose a couple of areas which they might wish to focus on for a set period of time. And if you look at that next uh, slide, it zooms in, thanks, on um, you know, some of the, the 13 questions that we ask in the rubric. So uh, you might want to go through as a group the entire rubric together and then say, OK, for this year or for this quarter or this semester, we're going to focus on points one, three, and nine or you know, whatever uh, your environment might request. And then we also thought about maybe having staff and youth divide into groups and then use the lens of two or three of these questions, two or three of these dimensions to rank a proposed practice or a practice you're already engaged in, such as what are our community agreements look like when we get together in group process? Uh, what are our requirements for uh, awards at the end of a uh, term or at the end of a summer camp session? Uh, what's our camp itinerary going to be like? Um, and what's included on our summer reading list? So these are sort of the, these are some of the areas that you can use the questions to uh, think more deeply about how you're practicing. And you'll see, if we can go back to the previous slide, that you can use the rubric. You'll see the rubric in three different ways. So first is the infographic that's on uh, the far left side of your slide. And that has the guiding questions, and that's sort of for quick reference. Then you'll also see it as a table with questions and explanations of what beneficial practice looks like. If uh, a practice is harmful on the other side, on the other hand, or if it's kind of in the middle and could use some, some improvement. So for each question, you'll see practices described that fall into the beneficial, improving, or harmful categories. And then finally, you'll see it after um, some uh, prose discussion on that far right uh, tool as a table with the questions. And then it also adds examples to select practices in each domain. And as Joe mentioned, you know, we are definitely open and uh, excited to hear uh, your feedback on this. So we welcome the addition of new examples, new questions, and new clarifying language. And if um, I could make a recommendation just to close this section, I would recommend reading the tables with the explanations and examples side by side, right? So that you understand what the questions are that we're interrogating. And then you can see an example of good, bad, and needs improvement practice that falls under that question. Um, it's also great to encourage youth, staff, and parents to generate other examples and links to other resources, because we have some examples of people who are doing really great work in one section or the other, and but we're always looking for more. And then finally, it would be great to brainstorm together about how you might, you might move from one level of practice 
to a more beneficial one. Or if you're already doing something that's great and beneficial, wonder how that could be applied to another section of the rubric or another question um, that you might not be um, practicing as beneficially on. So I know that Keith is going to walk through um, a, a use case with us. Um, you can see, like I said, some quick examples of, um, of practices that we thought were beneficial, that we thought needed improvement, and the questions themselves. And so look forward to chatting with you all some more about that at the end. Thank you so much, Beth. Uh, and thank you for segueing to Keith. Now I'd like to invite Keith Miller, who is uh, one of the architects or authors of the impending Project Ready 3.0 curriculum to provide a use case uh, for the rubric document. And uh, they are, have just completed a health and wellness unit. And he's going to talk us through how he was able to utilize or reflect on what was written against uh, one or two of the elements from the rubric. Keith? Yes, welcome. So can you unshare Adenike so I can pop up some slides? Alrighty, welcome everyone. I want to be very sensitive to everyone's time. So let me just say, hey, how you doing? Can't wait to chat more. Um, one of the things that is so exciting about being able to witness this and just be a part of this journey is being able to see the ways in which uh, when we think about social emotional learning, how it is not just something that is done one time and will forever persist, right? This is a, con a continuous relationship, an ongoing commitment that we, um, everyone involved, whether it be the young people, the community, the participants, the facilitators, everyone is kind of involved. So one thing I wanted to show you before I jumped into that specific section is that there is a larger picture here I want you to be uh, mindful of. And so the larger curriculum itself is actually two major chunks. So it's the college and career uh, ready section and what we call life ready, which is embedded with a lot more going on, everything from college and career readiness, but to youth participatory action research, really trying to deliver on not just teaching at young people, but ensuring that they are agents in this change making, right? Um, skills development, but also wellness. And so what we're gonna be actually be looking at shortly is that uh, a lesson plan package that we call the health and wellness section. Um, when we think about social emotional learning, it is not just what we are teaching, it is how we teach it. Um, and as a result, it also requires us to be continually asking questions. I love how Beth said, what are the practices that are kind of undergirding what success looks like in this space? And so we kind of look at this in two ways. One, there's the lesson plan layout that is consistent for every single plan. That includes everything, ensuring that young people are welcomed into the space and they have time to transition. Right, that includes everything from uh, the implementation of something we call the mood ringer sign-in sheet, where young people are able to communicate where they are and are showing up emotionally, whether with their name and emoji and sounds to be able to express who they are in that moment, but also being able to circum support that with youth leadership by ensuring that there are two to three young people who are peers, who as the workshop is going on, they are able to follow up and circle back with any of their peers, especially who are in a, mo a moment of need and say, hey, you came into this workshop feeling this way, how you feeling? What, what else do you need, right? This idea of a warm up. one of the things that I think is so frustrating when we think about uh, traditional classroom management is that traditional classroom learning doesn't actually work for anybody, <laughs> right? This is something that we actually know. Um, and so the reality is that ensuring that young people are able to, as indigenous cultures say, uh, have that first circle, right? Where we can transition from wherever you are coming into, right? To be prepared to learn and then be able to have that second circle to ensure that you can close up, do what you need to do to go back into the world that you are living in because our young people and our families are all braving against a number of different factors. Um, also understanding that we have activities that are specific, but that we also must ensure that our young people and our facilitators have a ritual of decompression understanding that if we're doing this work the right way, we are unpacking large and important conversations that we also need to break from. Uh, one of the things that we also kind of embed in this larger process is always ensuring that before a young person leaves a workshop space, before a facilitator leaves, everyone gets their flowers. We like to call that the share out. 
Um, no matter how a young person may want to share, whether it be readings, uh, having a, an adult read their piece because they're too shy or whatever the case may be, ensuring that every voice is valued and being able to find ways for the young people to share out and, and, and be heard. Now, some embedded supports that we talk about is something as simple as a it's a vibe session playlist. One of when we think about one of these terms that I really appreciate is this focus on language, the ways in which also racism is embedded within the ways in which we even un understand what is acceptable language. How can you be allowed to or not be allowed to to communicate how you feel in the moment? One of the barriers that we um, find to be a beautiful way to kind of de dismantle this is by ensuring that young people throughout the entire workshop are throwing up music that they are proud of, that they want to hear as a continual soundtrack of like uh, inclusion and ways for people to be able to also be heard and seen. Um, in some of these section and lesson assessments, we believe in the reality that young people have to drive um, and allow us to understand what does work, what doesn't work. I think oftentimes as education scholars, we'll be like, oh, and then you do this and this and this, and then success. And the reality though, is that if we're trying to deliver on this cake, that Joe was talking about, me being a huge lover of German chocolate. So if somebody can do a vegan German chocolate, I'm here. Um, the reality is that it takes a continual refinement where everybody's palate has to continually be a part of that larger process. Uh, the final thing that I'll say before I just jump on is that SEL, as, um, as Joe and Beth have said already, is not just for the young people. When I am consulting for school districts and members and community, a lot of the focus is on the young people, the young people, the young people. But the reality is that our young people pick up on the fact that adults are beefing in the space. Adults don't like each other. So why would you expect a young person to listen to you if you are not living and moving in the way that you should be? Um, and so ultimately we embed facilitators notes and as a separate user's guide to ensure that facilitators are able to embody the very things that we are talking about. So here's a quick example of what a health and wellness ex uh, the excerpt looks like. One of the things that I hope you see very quickly is the way it is written, right? Um, so the reality is that at, the, at the, the, the portal entrance of language, we are ensuring that there is intention that young people are a part of a larger process. When we think about social emotional learning, it is not just a set of tools. We believe it is a, an integral foundation that will allow young people, community, um, and everyone a part of that process to meet our young people at their level of dreaming. Because if we're working with young people the way we need to, we are not actually trying to make them understand and only be here. We rely on them to help and co-create this world where they can lead us out of some of the very uh, restrictive and oppressive things that we are experiencing now, which requires us to ensure the young people get exposed to the difference in the spaces and to thrive from that. So, these are two just super uh, short examples of the types of um, lesson plans that we have. And what we're gonna do is actually focus a little bit more on one particular section. So this one is called the fortifying me to build we. Social emotional learning, even just within this particular process is an, uh, an embedded process that is in every step of the workshop activities. So we're looking at this uh, expectation around, okay, well, young people are in a workshop, well, we believe that young people have to play a role in co-creating safe and brave spaces. We have to have a conversation about safe and brave spaces because one of the things that's under attack around this country is the reality that no one wants our young people to grapple with the hard things that we deem only for adults, but expect them to sit and passively deal with the consequences and the lack of their learning and not even being able to bond with their peers because they don't actually know the diversity that is in the room. Right. And so there are a number of different kind of ways in which we approach this, everything from bringing in a number of different types of expression to ensuring that all of the mentor texts that are in a space look like the young people in the room. Right. Um, and so when we are also thinking about this just super simple example, there are a few pieces I'm going to just pull out that are in alignment with some of these 10 principles that we were talking about, these particular rubric pieces that I hope can just paint a quick picture of the way in which we are learning that, that this can be a continually informed process that is ongoing, right? We, there are key, six key ones I can tell you that I'm especially proud of y'all, right? But the, what we know is that this curriculum is meant to be a start and a continuing of that conversation, right? So for example, when we think about asset-based, right? One of the things that we have in one of our um, 
mental wealth, mental, mental, mental health, is this idea that we're talking to our young people about health, mental health, about wellness, right? Um, but oftentimes when we want to do that, people immediately jump to the clinical medical definitions that are inherently deficit-based. And so here's an example of a deficit, uh, excuse me, of a facilitator's note in the actual lesson plan that says we deliberately will not be taking a clinical approach to trauma rooted in medical definitions. Why? Because that is not strength-based. The reality is that if we want our young people to be able to have critical conversations about mental health and see themselves thriving, we absolutely have to ensure that they understand the diversity in which people may be experiencing the life and the trauma around them, right? And so in this particular case, we ensure that the facilitator knows we will be taking a different approach. We're gonna be analyzing popular culture and creative writing and various forms of expression so that young people can have power in renegotiating their own relationship with trauma. Because in, and when we think about, I've had a, a series of workshops where I've had young people murdered in my program. So how can we come into a space and talk about, oh, we're gonna talk about uh, literacy, right? But this just happened. How do we ensure that social emotional learning allows us to be responsive and proactive in ensuring that what we're really teaching our young people are ways in which to negotiate how they can deal with the world around them, not run from it, okay? One, if you take a look at that last paragraph, it is a hopefully a clear through line of how we approach this curriculum. You know your young people, and if you don't, only do the workshops when you do, right? Understanding that our young people play a powerful role in that. Here's another example of a, a, a facilitator's note around asset-based and language. So one of, I talked to you already about the is about playlist, right? Young people should be allowed to put whatever song they want to put up there. So if they want to put up 21 Savage, then they should be allowed to put 21 Savage. Now, I know I'm a bit liberal in that, but what we are ultimately saying in this is that you can't make that choice for them. If you want to have a conversation around restrictions, it has to be a collective conversation where all of the people in this space agree to that limitation and then have to the ability to demonstrate the agency of how they will create a middle ground for that. Because if young people cannot speak the knowledge and the vocabulary that, that is home to them, then how can we expect them to be vulnerable enough to learn and create change? Um, another example is one of the first activities we do, as you saw in the co-creating a safe space, is what we call a community shape. Now that community shape is literally this visual where it doesn't matter what it looks like, what ultimately ends up happening is that there is a shape that is closed and young people write on the inside what they want in the space, on the outside, what they don't, and on the line, all the stuff that's complicated, right? And so, for example, on the inside, they may have trust, hope, snacks, you must always have snacks, hope, active listening, et cetera, right? Gender pronouns, right? On the outside, they may have bullying, isms, right? Cursing at each other, disrespect, all right? Unpacking these things. Now, what we say is that the facilitator's role in this process is to put mine it out of the young people and deliberately be the one who makes those vulnerable decisions to put the things that people may not wanna talk about, right? What I found in my experience is that young people will absolutely put homophobia, right? They will absolutely put classism, right? Or they will put the vocabulary that makes sense to them. And your job is to ensure that everyone is on the same page. On the line, we may put profanity as an example, right? Because what we really want our young people to understand is that you are a multi-tongued person right? What you, how you may speak with your friends may be different with how you may speak in leading a conference presentation. Both, all those tongues are valid as they are a part of your historical being, but the way you mobilize those is what the true skill is, is that's being required. Key point here, y'all, it's an opportunity to talk through and develop a mutual vocabulary of accountability and responsibility to and for one another, right? So that's an example. Uh, another thing about adaptability is that when we think about a curriculum, a lot of people will say, hey, you have this curriculum, you do it forever, amen, <laughs> right? If, if amen is a part of your culture, right? Um, now, the reality here though, is that that is not a curriculum. A true curriculum is an ongoing living document where there is a base foundation, right? That facilitates the growth and learning experiences of all parties together, but they have to continually play a role in shaping and modifying it ensuring it evolves with the times. And so there are moments, for example, where we have a young, we have a cool activity 
but we tell a person in this facilitator's note, if your young person doesn't feel comfortable doing that, here is a way in which you engage them in leadership until they are. Understanding that this work moves at the speed of trust. And we know that trust isn't always possible until a young person feels safe. This comes from a realization that I often run programming uh, in juvenile court spaces where young people have experienced a compound level of trauma that has made it difficult for them to see their brilliance. And our job is to help them connect and pull all of that out by respecting where their boundaries are, okay? Another example of adaptability is that we have this really cool video montage for one of the workshops around unpacking mental health. Um, that is a video montage that has a lot of really cool different content. We recognize that regardless of how liberal or whatever a person may be and what the, we want to expose their young people to, they should always have a choice to be able to replace it with other information that they feel is more accessible or more um, accurate for the context for their young people. And so continually ensuring that there are always additional options is important. Another example that I love is around the identity um, development piece. When we talk about um, specifically Black young people, very few people ask our young people or they, them ask themselves, who am I? Who am I within the context of my skin color, of my culture, of the language I speak, of my abilities, of whatever? And so this is an example that social emotional learning within this larger curriculum is not just a set of lesson plans. It is a host of activities that are designed and intentional in ensuring that young people have the space to unpack um, a part of number of different lesson plans, but in a way that allows them to do so safely on their own terms and individually, but also in, uh, in larger relationship with one another. Um, here's another example of language. This is a check-in activity where uh, this is an example of a format of how the facilitator can come into the space. And this is my example. So if a person, if I have young people in the space, I would literally say, I woke up this morning feeling like, man, you better go somewhere with all that. I got to work feeling like not today, not the one, not at all. But I got here feeling like, man, there's no place I'd rather be, right? Ensuring that everything that we do with our young people as facilitators is an invitation. Um, I think the number one thing in all the work that I've done with a lot of our young people, especially Black young people, is that no one asks, no one invites, no one says, hey, do this with me. Teach me how to teach you in a way that feels right so that you can teach others, right? Um, one final thing that I'll say is in uh, one of the action empowerment orientation pieces, there is one of the most foundational activities in this section called Healing Action Maps that was actually derived out of a really um, intense experience where we did lose the young person. Um, and we had to facilitate healing for the staff and the young people at the same time. When we think one of the pieces of the rubric that I really appreciate, especially is this idea around uh, not just asset-based, but how are we ensuring that um, individuals are able to have agency in unpacking the things that they need to, right? And so that includes everything from ensuring that there's the language is representative of them, but also uh, there's action and empowerment and them being able to play a role in their own exploration and learning. And so I just shared this quick quote because I don't have much time, um, but may this quote be an example of how, what is ultimately at the heart of this is ensuring that our young people understand um, what uh, Sister Audrey says, which is I've come to believe over and over again that what is most important to me must be spoken made verbal and shared, even at the risk of having it bruised or misunderstood. I am not only a casualty, I am also a survivor. Uh, excuse me, I am also a warrior. Um, and so in a lot of these, when we were kind of just examining the ways in which this might look, right? Looking at these 10 um, elements, what I just shared in this presentation focused on primarily six of those, right? And so it was asset-based, action and empowerment, um, safe and supportive climate, identity development, adaptability, um, and language. There were four that I did not spend a whole lot of time on, right? And that was collectivist orientation, uh, explicit anti-racism, although um, that is a, something that is undergirded in a lot of our work um, in, in the foreground. Um, um, cultural orientation, which when we dig a bit deeper, you will see that it, we meet our young people in culture and allow them to speak back in whatever they can at every chance, right? Um, but also one of my favorite pieces that I, uh, our team is looking even closer at is sufficient resources. So uh, one of the things I may have um, I shared at least initially is this reality that when we look at um, this curriculum, 
there is a major piece that is specifically focused on youth participatory action research, where young people are literally spending an entire unit working to find an issue they want to change and do so in conjunction with community and institutions and to have a clear deliverable at the end. I think ultimately, no matter whether it's the focus of youth participatory action research, or if it's a simple section like health and wellness, the goal is that this work is centered around ensuring that when we talk about social emotional learning and when we continue to evaluate it with this urban league framework, what we're really asking ourselves in which ways are we delivering on the promise and shaping the ways in which individuals will ensure that what we do with our young people is led by, guided by and informed by them in community. And that we ensure that this framework and this rubric that is being shared is just the beginning. And, and if anything, it's a path for how we can move forward. Thanks, Keith. Um, I know we just have a few more minutes left uh, with our one hour and 15 minutes. I would love to invite uh, folks. I know we've, we've seen a lot of activity in the chat. Would love for folks to um, surface and raise any questions you may have about the social and emotional learning tools that we presented to you today. Hi, um, I just wanted to put it out there that this is the first time that in a very long time that I'm actually excited about a curriculum. You know, we attend these things and it's like, okay, that's great. Um, but this is the first time that I'm excited to be able to see something that I think is gonna be relevant and actually useful and interesting. So uh, a lot of the work that I do is in after school. We have a lot of young people that come in our direct service staff and you know you give them these materials and they're not excited about using them. So they, they're not used to fidelity. And I think this is something that everyone's gonna enjoy being able to use. Thank you, thank you. Anybody else have questions or anything they would like to elevate for the group? I just wanted to give Keith a couple more flowers that, uh, you know, I noticed that his um, presentation and the, the practices that he shared actually hit on a couple of the other elements of the rubric that he didn't mention. So the allowing young people to um dictate uh you know what some of the shape of the program was going to be and with the playlist and with the um the practices that were inside or outside the circle right that was all about adaptability that was all about anti-hierarchy right like moving away from this very command and control kind of structure that we sometimes see in um social and emotional learning or training people to to conformity and also attention to that emotion wasn't something to be uh, packed away and hidden, and uh, but something that is to be channeled toward your learning and your growth and development. So um, those things came out very strongly in what you shared as well, Keith. And so congratulations on what looks like a fantastic uh, uh, program. Final thoughts. Look at that. Talk about playlist. <laughs> Luther Vandross. <laughs> um, anything else that folks want to share? Questions that you may have about the tools? Well, I did. I did have. I see a question in the chat that I was curious about, and I saw you uh, touched on it, Adenike. But is the rubric, um, for example, is there a particular like? measurement tool outside of the, the rankings that allows individuals to kind of track their progress and ability to, to deliver on these SEO outcomes? So we talked a little bit about, and we thought about doing a, you know, numerical <laughs> ranking system that, you know, would cause people to put it in a spreadsheet and tally up and all that sort of thing. And people can definitely do that if they would like to. They can assign a point system to the practices that are pro-development, harmful versus beneficial. Um, and so that's a, that's a way of entering the process, but you can also just do it in a more qualitative sort of way, you know, through discussion um, with the folks who are uh, your, your young people, with your staff, with the parents, or with the other folks in your community who are, who are working on the, the issue with you. And 
um, if we could uh, add an EK, I just wanted to, to close with a, a brief story. Uh, I met a rancher uh, from Florida recently and he said, you know, I raise uh, both sheep and goats, but I only have to tie up the goats. And I said, well, why is that? And he says, well, um, you know, a goat, you tie a rope around its neck and uh, tie it to a post and it'll stretch as far as it can um, to see, you know, to the end of that rope. And then it'll keep trying to stretch a little farther. But a sheep will go to the end of where the goats are tethered and then say, eh, I don't think I should go any further. So you don't have to enclose those sheep. So not only are the sheep not realizing that they are unencumbered, that they are untethered, that they're free and could wander around and expand their uh, universal possibilities, they're accepting the limitations that have been placed on somebody else. And they're making those limitations their own. And meanwhile, the goat is always stretching its neck and trying to get a little bit further away or engaging with this environment and experimenting and testing and seeing, can I extend my back leg and get a little further away? Or can I loosen up this rope a little bit? Or maybe if I lead with my front legs, it'll be different. And always trying to get free, right? And I think in many cases, the hidden curriculum, the explicit curriculum of our social emotional learning, we raise uh, young folks to be polite, kind sheep. And this uh, current moment is calling us to develop some more goats and be more like goats. So hopefully the principles and the rubric and interrogating the practices that you're currently engaged in can allow you to um, you know, think more deeply together as a community with how we can build some more goats into our uh, youth development spaces. Thank you so much, Beth. That's and nice. thank you all for joining us today for the public release of our National Urban League social and emotional learning tools for equity. You can find the link for the, the resources for the tools in the chat uh, where you can download each of the documents uh, for yourself and please feel free to share them as widely as possible. We certainly don't want this to be sitting on a shelf. We are excited about this work. We are happy that many of you are also excited and we just want to continue building, growing and developing. Thank you all so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. Take care, everyone.